should start the meeting. It's nine o'clock, and we do have a guest with us, Dave Jeffco um, from Kitsap Bank. I'm not seeing any other business representatives, so we'll talk about how we want to do the agenda. But one thing that I feel is incumbent on me to say, and this is for Dave's uh, use and everyone else's use, we have been informed by our city clerk that as far as public records are concerned, this is a, an official committee of the city council. So therefore, it is subject to um, public records requests. What we have been informed of recently is if someone does a public records request and um, your cell phones are could be part of that, your personal cell phones. So if someone does a public records request, Brandy, perhaps you could explain how it works. So are you talking about actions being done during a, a during right. the committee meeting? Okay, so for um, personal devices being used during a city council meeting, whether it's a uh, regular meeting or ad hoc or committee meeting, um, the public has um, the right to put in a request for records that are being um, conducted or created or looked at during a committee meeting or a council meeting. Um, it doesn't mean that they get access to it, but they have the right to ask for it. And then what happens is when those records are produced, you go through them and determine what is city business and what is personal and you weed out the business and the personal, and then if the requester still believes that there's some things that were not turned over or provided, then they have to go to the um, Superior Court and get an injunction and, and do an in-camera review. But, so I think that the point is, is that the public's watching, they're looking, you just kind of want to make sure that, you know, anything that you're doing um, represents the city, I guess. Right, and I just want to make sure that everyone knows that if you're in a meeting and your cell phone is out, any personal device is out, it could be subject to a public records request. If they're using it. If they're during, using it. For city yeah. business. Right, but you right. have to. Okay. Um, so the records related to city business is what would be turned over. Correct. Okay. We, yes. I agree with you, we think it would be a good idea just for your party to turn over anything you would possibly build would be subject to the request. Correct, but I believe that believe they haven't got everything they were looking for they could come back and then you would have to perhaps turn your cell phone over to Brandy and she would review it is that correct Brandy um, I would do the first review and yeah. then um, if it progresses then a uh, Superior Court judge would review yeah. it. I just wanted everyone at the table to be aware of that because particularly I'm not worried about council members and Dave's the only one here today but I'm worried about our business folks that come and visit they need to be, because in their working world, they don't have these same rules that they live under. So. And there is two cases, and I'm looking up those cases, they're older cases, they're like 2009, 12, 11-ish, so um, I'm gonna find those two cases and I'll provide it to the council. What we provided, I happen to know, is very, very interesting, because there is some people specifically who use it for county business and did not want to turn over those records. And so we have I think most times, nine out of 10 times, it's the ones that have city business on the personal phone that they don't turn over for whatever reason and it lands in, in the courts. So, you know, if it's purely personal, then, you know. Right, right. I just wanted, yeah, yeah. I just wanted our, our <laughs> well, I just wanted our guests to be aware of it. Silence. Yeah. Thank you. So, because we don't have we have Dave as the only business representative here. I'm going to move that discussion to the end, and then if we don't have anyone else, it could be just us talking, but it may be more beneficial if there were additional people here. Okay. Yeah, she was on vacation. Oh, she was? Yeah, she
So we'll go on down to the city trademark. And Brandy, do you want to leave that? Yeah, so there's, um, so last year sometime, um, it was uh, discussed that we wanted to trademark the uh, Wayfinding logo. So we have moved forward and officially trademarked the logo um, for certain materials. And so the next step in that process was, process was to um, adopt a policy or an application um, basically for the use of the, of the what's being um, um, trademarked. <laughs> and so when originally when we trademarked, and I think I talked about this briefly, but I'll just kind of sum re resummarize, re whatever, recap. So what we had originally done is when, before we trademarked, we went to the council and said, okay, what items do you want to trademark? And so there was a big list formed and sent it off to the state and the state came back and said, yeah, it doesn't work that way. So what it is is items that already have the logo or the image um, and has actively been used by the creator or the user, um, they can trademark it. So what we were able to trademark was uh, marketing materials, jewelry because of the lapel pin, and, um, oh, there was another one. I think it was, no, I think it was signs. It had to do, it, it was, and, um, it had to do with um, marketing. Maybe that's what it was, marketing, um, advertising, and um, jewelry. And so we went ahead and moved forward and trademarked those items. So at this point, the policy and the use application is strictly for those three items only. Um, and then as we use the logo, we can add on um, the trademark for those images as well, like if we put it on a vehicle or if we put it on clothing and, and so forth. Um, so my question is, and when I spoke to the state representative, she kind of was questioning, you know, why are we doing it? Because we are typically doing the opposite of why most people trademark items, meaning that we're trademarking, trademarking it because we don't want anybody outside of the city using it. And we actually are encouraging people outside, nonprofits, right. people that are, you know, right. holding events to use it. And so she said, well, you know, you can go ahead and record it. She goes, you can go ahead and trademark it. The only thing that's gonna come back is if the city challenges it against that person, then you know you would have some sort of ground. So I guess my question to the committee is: One, do we want to move forward with some sort of policy and use for people outside to use it? I'm assuming we would. And then the other part of it is a fee. And what I had done is, you should have been provided an email from the city treasurer that basically captures how it, how it would work if we were to trademark it and you ca capture a fee on the, um, what's it called, the first? The first weekend. point of sale. Yeah, yeah. first point of sale. Um, it's kind of cumbersome. I think it's basically, if I remember correctly, it's, it's basically an honor system. Um, and then I think we heard comments from, I believe, nonprofit or two that basically said hey if we have to pay to use it we're not gonna yep. use it exactly so that's kind of thought well hmm do we want to create something that we want we only want an event in case somebody was profiting on right. it so if the nonprofit was using it to advertise we would need a fee right and in, in the um, the first one that we had um, and there's two yeah ones there's for a, internal ones, ones for, for external, external. Yeah. right but the one basically says nonprofits don't have a fee. And for profits have this 5% of the gross sales amount on the first sale. And I'm finding that, as Treasurer Martin did, cumbersome. And so I would say perhaps that we, what I would offer we take forward to work study is perhaps a flat fee for processing the application. You know, a fifty dollar, a hundred dollar fee. I don't for think profit. For profit, correct. I don't Personal think use or whatever. Right. I don't think we're going to. We don't want to um, 
make something that's cumbersome and so that no one's going to use it. have a situation in the future we can always change it. Questions I had on this is we're requiring um, the application to be filled out and I just wanted to make sure that that application was part of our LTAC forms or in our contract so that the people that we, the organizations that are receiving LTAC money do not have to do another step to be able to use the trademark. There is already in the agreement that they can use it. It's just part of the right. agreement. So if you want an additional step. No, I just okay. want to make, I just wanted to be clear okay. that we want people, the organizations that are either have, that we've approved for events downtown mm -hmm. or that are receiving LCAP money get to use this whatever sort of language we need in our contract or agreements so that they don't have to go through an extra step. I think it needs to be a little bit clearer in the contract because of this new process and I'll make sure that there's some language in the contract that gives them authorization to use. Okay. The other question I had is terms and condition for use of the Wayne County logo. And I'm over on the second. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be right up here. It says the logo shall not be used in any manner which is, oh no, it's the top one, it's the one above that. The logo shall not be used in connection with marketing for any entity other than the city of Port Orchard. Mm -hmm. And that confused me because we're mm -hmm. using it for events. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how that needed to be worded. thing that I was um, unclear of or is further down on that page it says proper use and it says the following are general guidelines for the proper use of the logo and then it says any use of the logo that is inconsistent with these guidelines but I couldn't find the guidelines. Hmm. I found prohibited uses. Yeah, I wonder if this should be. Where did you see that? Oh, those guidelines. <coughs> Those guidelines, I think, are um, <laughs> I think the guidelines on the other page have to do with approval of uh, use of the logo. So I don't know, maybe that paragraph just needs to be reworded or something. Yeah, it says that throughout it, so. referring to guidelines back there. And maybe maybe that maybe that is the but again it, it says a lot of what you can't do. These this here. This where it says guidelines. Yeah. This is yeah. And then up on trademark logo it uses guidelines again so So we just want to be clear um, before we take it to work study that either this section is in fact the guidelines or we need a guideline section or we need it reworded.
Anything else? say July, July just I don't because think I'm going to be out of town for the June one. Right. I mean, you could move it forward in June if you want or anything. And I just have a question. Mm -hmm. In the application mm -hmm. for other, it's almost like an email address if you were given that much area to write an email address. If the commercial nonprofit government agency could be moved over mm -hmm. and change the, the uh, ID to the organization type or MA of creating a little more space just to give the other the back of the application, um, this might, oh, the, I had circled this one, that might be words that you want to use in the other area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm hearing is we're going to take this forward to the July work study. Is there, is, it's an August work study that we're trying to that avoid? I believe so, yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. Okay. So then we will go on to, did, does this committee have a recommendation of what that flat fee looks like? $100, $50? What, what fee? The flat, oh, fee the flat fee for commercial purposes. I would say 100 or 50. Once again, I wish we had a good bad facility to know what they're trying to do and how it impacts what they want to pay, but, but at least 50. Um, do we really need to answer the questions that but um, it all boils down to if we're looking for royalty fees. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that is a concern of us right now. Do we have anything on Broadway that gives us just that municipal controller and put our big financial component in the channel and benefit? So, and so if that's not the case, why don't we just tack that down the road, whatever we're talking about now? And just keep it simple. It sounds like you're just looking for more money. So we're, um, I'm not thinking that we need to bring it back to this committee. We can just go to work study. And then we will move on to the sign code and Nick, I'll let you. Yeah, so this is, um, the sign code has moved ahead a little bit faster than we thought it would. Um, the planning commission was able to get through it. How many? How um, many public comment? We had two different individuals testify during our 60-day public comment period. We had zero written testimony. Um, so procedurally, I mean, the Department of Commerce notification, SEPA, everything is out of the way for a council to be able to take action. Okay. And so I guess the the big question right now is how do how does this move forward with our unified development code? And I'm assuming that.
questions and we can either start with the other signs or we can go through some of my other questions and then do the meatier thing at the end. Um, the first thing I wanna say is <coughs> under part one, our intent, if you read Section 80, intent, at the end, it says it is the intent of the city to limit the size, type, location of signs in order to minimize their distracting effect on drivers and therefore improve traffic safety. So that's one of our primary intents. I just want us to keep that in the back of our mind. When, um, and then just for clarification, interior signs, signs or displays located entirely inside of a building and located at least three feet away from transparent doors and windows. So the, the sign has to be back? Well, it's exempt. Oh, those are ex those are exempt, exempt from the sign code okay. it's within three feet of an interior window. Okay. Um, And we have a whole section here that is a italicized optional limitation on sign area. Um, what page are you on? Uh, nine. I didn't, I, I guess I wasn't sure why that was italicized. You know, that was, I have to go back and look at my notes as okay. to whether that was. And we're not talking about right of way at all. We're talking about street um, usage permits. Because it seems to me we've eliminated right of way most of the places we've got. Okay. A question I had, and now I'm on page 15. Um, this is under the section non-conforming signs, maintenance, removal, and enforcement. And under the maintenance section, there's a, uh, under two, there's landscape maintenance. And there's required landscape areas contained by a fixed border it, um, shall receive regular repair and maintenance. And my, um, my question wasn't so much in the sign code, it was just in general code. Do we have any landscape maintenance um, within the city or what zones in the city? There are two ways that landscape is required to be maintained. One of them is under the nuisance code and that's for, you know, if you have weeds or other things that are above a certain height or you have uh, vegetation, you would be able to apply for maintenance. Um, but when, when you develop a site in a landscape plan, So let's just talk about the new development going into McCormick Woods. Um, if they have landscape in their entrance or some sort of landscape requirements that are part of their permit, th those, the city can require those to be maintained. Correct. But the individual homes, there's no requirement. Correct, except is enforced through the HOA out there. Okay, okay. Well, I was just thinking about my neighbor. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah,
I know that we've, I've had a citizen comment a couple times and I forward them on and this helps clarify that for me. Moving on with the sign code, I'm on page 18 and 29. And page 18, under figure two, they're talking about neon signs, mm -hmm. okay? And D, it says time limitations. All signs over three square feet in area shall be turned off by 9 p.m. or when the business closes, whichever is later, okay? So I read that and I was cool with that. I didn't have a problem. Then I went on to page 29 and now we're talking about electronic message signs. And it says at the top of the page under three, signs shall include an auto dimming feature. Oh no, number two, nighttime. One half hour before sunset to one half hour after sunrise. And I was wondering why we had it different in the two different parts of the code. You know, is there a reason? And, and I don't care, I was just curious. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think that the intent is to allow electronic message center signs to remain on, whereas the back bed signs, when something is closed, are supposed to go off. But um, it seems to me that the way this is written, they're, they're, we need to explicitly state that electronic message center signs may stay on even after a business closes I just want to point out, I just want to point out on page 19, um, down on D, freeway oriented signs, freeway oriented signs are prohibited except in the following instances. So if you have a business along Highway 16, you're, you're not to have um, signs oriented towards the freeway. There, there are w ways that you can get signs up there, but I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> and then, then we go to page 28. And again, I now I know that Clancy served on the sign code committee. So under D, under D right there, it says changeable copy signs are allowed in all zones, but shall not be allowed on properties containing a residential land use. Um, which page is that again? 28. My question on that one, and, and, you, and I know that you can answer it, is like homemade, homemade cafe, mm -hmm. because that is a mixed use building. It has a restaurant on the bottom and it has personal residence on the top. So the way I'm reading this, because there's a residential use, they cannot have a changeable sign. Is that correct or not correct? That's correct, yes. So. So we may want to figure out how to make that okay mm -hmm. because she will put up there, you know, open for dinner Thursdays and Fridays or, you know, chowders the special of the day or whatever. She has a sign there that changes. Okay. I think we can just add um, the words unless the property contains mixed use or... Yeah, mix, mixed uses. Okay. I just didn't want to... Um, Yeah, but she's in business professional. Hmm. 
No, I think, is it business professional? Isn't it basically from the courthouse down to us? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have to look at the map to yeah. confirm that. But um, I, I understand what you're saying. I think we can provide some additional information there. Um. We're not allowing any digital signs in residential areas. For which area? We're still we're still digital signs. It's the same page. It's just the next section down. Correct. Digital signs are in non-residential zones only. So a home-based business can't have a digital sign in no. their window. time issue and I just had again on page 29 under number and we go to two one freestanding sign is allowed for each site frontage flag lot sites with frontage on a public street are permitted one freeze what's the flag lot it's it's where you have a narrow driveway basically have a driveway entrance that goes out to the main road, but you, you don't have the full width of your, the developable portion of your lot. Okay, do we have, I, I'm sorry, I should have. That term is defined in the zoning code. Okay, because I couldn't find it yeah, it's in the back. Okay. There's a couple of other terms that sometimes are used as panhandle lot. was really good. Um, now I guess let me go through the back of this because then I think we're too the next session is is under the portable signs that's where we're going to have more discussion so let's move on to page 40 and I'm on C and a lot of this again is just explanation for me um, <clears throat> these are our rooftop signs and we get down to that last sentence under C Roof mounted signs shall in no case exceed 25 feet in height above the average grade immediately adjacent to the portion of the roof to which the sign is affixed. My question is, how tall is that going to be? I mean, where did we get 25 feet? I think it's in the drawing. So we, we got this drawing um, out of another sign code. And so if you had a two story building, Essentially, first of all, the idea of the roof sign is that when you have the sloping portion of the roof facing the front of the building, you have very little opportunity to mount a sign to a face. There's no gable, there's no, um, there's no right. good place to put it without covering up windows. And so that was the instance where we thought that roof signs would be appropriate. And so this would allow a sign, basically, a small sign to be just above the roof eaves on a two-story building. So most of the time, So on the one-story building, can they still go up 25 feet? Um, provided it's on the lower third of the roof pitch. So presumably you're going to have a very steep roof. Then. And I'm saying I don't care. I just want to make sure that we don't have a sign, you know, way above the... It would be very unique architecture to do it. I mean, you'd have a... You'd have to have a 50-foot building at least to, to get a sign... I just, it just was something that came. Um. Uh, 
on page 41. Again, I just kind of want to make sure I understand this. Um, we're under um, section the, where it says sign walkers. Mm -hmm. Sign walkers are allowed subject to the following standards. Um, I think I have a, a concern about, these are the people I'm assuming that are throwing around the arrows. Cheap weed. Yeah, cheap weed, right. Or, you know, Liberty Tax Service or, or whatever it is. And I'm wondering if we want to allow those on um, our through streets, mainly 160, 166 in Tremont. The reason that this is written the way that it is is there's very specific case law in Washington that actually involves Kitsap County, and so this was written to pass a legal test. And okay. I don't think you want to tamper with it. Okay. You yeah. No, I just are yeah. prepared to fight for it. Okay. <laughs> Sign, the portable sign area. So I, I will start the portable sign discussion. I'm going to give you a little background on this. When we initially presented a draft sign code to the sign advisory committee, feather signs were not allowed at all. And so this was something that the committee felt was important. And they had long discussions on how many and what the spacing ought to be or how you ought to, to determine the space. That was Why one of my questions. Why are you only allowing one or two a board signs when you're allowing up to 12 feather signs? And I said, well, we didn't propose to allow feather signs at all. Correct. Uh, so just a little background on uh, where that discussion has gone. And, uh, and then the, the handout that I provided you was um, the staff work with Stephanie Bailey, one of our planning commissioners, on presenting some alternative language. She was not able to attend that planning commission meeting where they voted on this, but she sent her recommendation. One question, which will be easy to answer, is you've seen the dancing signs that are um, oh, like the goodness. cigarettes. It, I know that I had a pen one. When North Bay Mortgage was passing out all of the pens, we had a dancing pen sign. Is that a feather sign or is that a portable sign? That is a prohibited sign. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's listed under prohibited signs that signs activated by Right, 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 right. So it's clearly prohibited because okay. of the Thank nature you. of its operation. Exactly. Okay, that's what I was going to bring up. And again, an easy one to answer is under that multi-tenant lots. Um, it's saying the property owner shall determine which businesses may utilize a feather sign allocation on any particular lot. Um, I don't care about that, but I don't know how the city monitors it. If we're having to do a sign permit mm -hmm. and approve a sign permit, you know, what what documentation are we going to require from the building owner? The, the property owner or the managers uh, would have to sign the application. Okay. Um, and essentially the only reason we have this clause is that there could be a situation where you have more tenants in a multi-tenant complex than there are feather sign.
when the committee was making these decisions and having this deliberation, was any information brought forward regarding um, number of feather signs on a lot to increase in economic value to the business? So there wasn't any statistics given. It was just what they thought or how they felt. Yes. Okay. Was there any discussion or any evidence brought forward about distracting drivers and potential um, collisions because of feather signs? Yeah. going to propose is um, that when this goes to council's work study that we bring it forward the way the Planning Commission approved it and what came out of the committee I don't know that I would want to change that without additional council uh, input I would like it I would like also brought forward the um, suggestion by Stephanie Bailey or the one that she supported because she was unable to vote the night at the Planning Commission. I would like that brought forward as an alternative. I would also like an alternative brought forward going back to our intent that I originally read when we came in was that um, it's the intent of the city to limit the size, type, and location of signs in order to minimize their distracting effect on drivers. What we have, <clears throat> the testimony we've heard today that came out of both the Planning Commission and the, the Sign Code Committee is the reason they want the feather signs is because they are in fact distracting. They are not an informational sign saying uh, with an address or with um, this is how you get into our building. They're, you know, they're not informational. Th their intent is to draw your attention to them. And my proposal is that if, if, if it's critical to the commercial, to our businesses, that they can put one every 10 feet, okay. But I don't think they should be put every 10 feet on Sedgwick. Um, where we have our state highways and Tremont, where we are transporting volumes of people, I don't think we need distracting signs in those locations. To me, the, the, um, where we know traffic is going to run slower and there will be a lot of ingress, egress, are in roads like Bethel, um, you know, maybe Pottery, that Sedgwick, but, where we're moving cars through, and that's the intent of those streets, I don't think we need distracting signs. Uh, I have no problem with location signs, but I do have a problem with distracting signs. Um, and I think if we had, let's just take Sedgwick for an example, you could have West Coast Fitness with 12 feather signs. You could have the car dealership with 12 feather signs. You could have, um, the marijuana store on the other side with 12 feather signs and you've got a lot of activity and we're putting 25,000 cars a day 
down that stretch. I don't think it's an appropriate place for that number of feather signs. So I would like that brought forward as another um, alternative. The thing about Bay Street and their and their testimony on Bay Thorn is that is already um, uh, a commercial area, and I he's got four feather signs down there right now. I personally don't want to see another eight feather signs on there, plus all the cars. I mean, it's but I have a little bit of different feeling. So if, if the solution is this with one sign, up to four signs, four feather signs, I wouldn't find that as distracting or one feather sign as a dozen feather signs because you have to think of them collectively along a corridor. And if you remember, I pointed out earlier that as far as the freeway is concerned, you can't have any sign oriented through the, towards the freeway. And again, that's for traffic safety. So I would just like that to be a discussion at work study. I, I, I guess when I, I think that you're, when you name Sedgwick and Tremont, those are both, you know, we have very limited east-west corridors and they move a whole lot of volume. Correct. Particularly Tremont, we're going to have it under construction, so you know that kind of makes it a moot point for a while. But once it is up and running, we've got a whole educational thing to our community about how to go through these two roundabouts. And if you have a bunch of fluttering signs there, I don't think that that's um, you know in the best interest of safety until perhaps sometime in the future. The other thing that I would like is to consider, and I don't know if we would put it in this, but as we do our individual sub-area plans, I think um, there may be sign restrictions or availability of signs, perhaps specific to each sub-area plan. that I would be a lot more supportive if we had had statistical data on the economic like how it right yeah. how, you know because I don't want to remove that from any of our businesses but if it's if, if they can accomplish the same with one flag every 50 feet mm -hmm. I think that would be aesthetically more more pleasing so one of the other Right, and, and I had made note of that, yeah. Are, are feather signs going to be allowed on Bay Street then? On the proposal as it is now is, is to allow them, yes. See, and I have concerns just going down Bay Street if, some, if that were just um, all feather signs. put them all around their parking lot <laughs> on both sides. <laughs>
not on the not sidewalk. On the side. They could apartment. put something next to your building. Yeah. Like Lolly Mays could put something in your um, and and going around um, the um, roofer could put something. Ten feet could put something. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, it, it it can be allowed, but only by with a street use permit. But I think given the nature of the sidewalk, I don't think you. I think you can get an A board downtown, but the feather sign because. We used to have with those A boards, they had to have an application and um, certain insurances. Mm -hmm. and that's Do a requirement of a street use permit. Okay, and so the same would be required on feather signs. Correct. Okay. Or limiting, however, yeah. that yeah. And then we can look for some photographic examples and some any statistics we can find on this. If any exist, which you know, I'm not sure. We'll we can send to the planning, but we'll we'll take a look. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to think who to direct you to. Because we definitely don't want to take anything away from our business community that would right. yes. that would help them, but we also want to be mindful of our other responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because once they go up, it's hard to get them down. Mm -hmm. And I would also say we do find them decorative. There's a couple along Bay Street that I find tattered, and um, you know they're not maintained very well. So that's the other thing you want to think about. Do you want, um, do you want un, you know, unmaintained ones that have been there for four or five years that are faded and stuff? So with that said, I think we've completed all of our agenda and we'll go back to the business representative and do we want to 
talk or do we want to just try and get together the group when people are available? Okay. What I had wanted, um, what I had discussed with them for the agenda today was to talk a little bit about Explore Port Orchard. That is a group that was put together probably four or five years ago for collaborative marketing and it had been kind of independent and it's now been brought in to the chamber as a, a subcommittee of the chamber and wanted to discuss with the group how we wanted to <coughs> take that forward. <coughs> and then at our last meeting, Matt from the chamber was, um, had requested we talk about something. Um, and I believe it was the city taking the lead on or something and and I wanted to start that discussion at least find out exactly what it was that he was interested in doing and how we could put that together and I thought it had something to do with the Roger Brooks um, webinars about a one purpose or our, you know what's our primary focus or whatever. what's the destin not destination right. he used the um, what's the commonality the common theme right so we will, I will have a private conversation with them and, and perhaps it will be easier if we move that business section, um, give it a um, vacation during the summer and come back the first of September. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody is real busy doing things. Okay, I thank you all for your time and is there anything else? We'll just, you know.